Adamson's I called on behalf of the governor through the oil and gas folks the, to find out what type of um, uh, anger or support. By and large, people were disappointed that Tom was left, but uh, ultimately we do have to make sure the science drives this and it is a fair uh, process. Um, this next question will be directed to you first, Bill. In light of recent legislative action regarding the selection of art on the UW campus, what is the proper role of state government in restricting artistic expression? Well, the, again, the legislature's role in this is, the, 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 let's start with the university belongs to the people of the state of Wyoming. And if you want to have the entire state support your university and our university, then you have to recognize that folks around the state uh, have a great interest in, in what, uh, what takes place on the campus. With respect to artwork, there's, there's different issues. One issue is, is what about the expression of art that's placed around in buildings and on buildings, or in uh, art museums? That's an issue that I think generally uh, works itself out. There's another issue, and that is, when do you get to make the decision to make a material change, that is, dig up grass, build a facility on campus, so that one group gets to come in and express their views in a, uh, a met method that actually changes the campus. Now, ultimately, the trustees are the ones that are charged under the Constitution with the management of the university. And the trustees need to recognize that whether you like it or not, if you want to have support from the folks that are generating the resources to pay for the co college, you have to be prudent in what you do. And uh, the, if you say that uh, a, an individual gets to put whatever artwork they choose to do by going in and pulling out trees, pulling out grass, then let everybody have it. But if you're not going to do that, there needs to be some regulation. And I think the legislature has an interest in making sure that when material changes are made to a building that are permanent, the trustees are involved in it. Thank you. Anne. Well, I certainly agree that it's a, it would be a, a, a very good policy for there to be a sort of, if there, if there are two sides or more than one side to an issue, that uh, all sides be uh, represented in that artistic expression. Um, I do think that uh, conversations can be spurred by controversy and I think that a, a very appropriate place to have conversations about controversial issues is at a university. And so uh, I agree that uh, a balance between uh, all sides, all views of the issue would, should be part of that conversation. Uh, and But I do think that conversation should take place because as one of our founding fathers said, there is no topic so dangerous that it cannot be talked about. And so, so I think that uh, if we were to keep that in mind as we went through, say for example, the selection process for our works, uh, then, then we would probably be on better footing. Okay, um, staying on with the broad theme of education, what will you do to ensure the education of all Wyoming students, and what is your position on um, the granting of tenure for teachers. And that would be directed to Ann first, so I'll repeat that. Um, what will you do to ensure the education of all Wyoming students? Um, and um, what will you do, uh, the, 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 there's an aspect of the question which also is, how do you improve the quality of education? But then specific, what, what is your position on tenure and its role in that? Well, I think that uh, the state has done a, an excellent job over the past few years of investing in our education system, and I think that the education accountability uh, discussions that have been taking place in the state over the past few years as well uh, are aimed at trying to get at what is the return on the investment we've made. We've made substantial investments. What are we getting out of it? Um, what the best methods are to do that and where that's best laid is really not my forte. I am not an education policy expert but I do think that it's a fair question to ask. Um, so it, ensuring that we have quality education all across Wyoming starts with all of our local uh, school boards being able to set the standards, but also 
um, all of us trying to harmonize on what it is that uh, we think that our students should know to make us a competitive state going into uh, going into this globally competitive economy that we're entering into. Um, do I believe that tenure will improve uh, will improve improve the quality of education? I think that a, a well designed tenure system could potentially do that, but uh, I'm skeptical about whether standard tenure policies uh, that you see mostly in other states uh, are the answer. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's uh, that those are the way to go. Uh, I think that the tenure system that I see at the university is a, is a fine example of good tenure, which is essentially where you prove yourself uh, above and beyond a shadow of a doubt, and uh, you do that for many, many years, and until that point you're at will. And uh, you need to have uh, not just quality. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, with respect to the, uh, the education law, that's an area that uh, when I started the legislature, that was my greatest interest particularly with K-12 education. Um, during the time that I've been in the legislature, we went from the lowest funded in the, uh, the uh, United States to the highest funded per capita, which we should be given in our rural nature. Uh, the, uh, what, you, what I think you do to make sure that uh, you have the best educational system is very simple. You make sure that every community has the same resources and we're all in the same um, plane. And what you find is the folks in Gillette have just as much interest as we do in making sure that our ch children are well educated, they have great facilities. And as long as everybody is together, we'll get to the right results. So that if there's a sacrifice, we all sacrifice. If we have great schools, we all have great schools. And we'll all drive the education system to where we want to be. So the biggest instance is making sure that you have a good system statewide is to make sure it's equal. And that there are no winners and losers. We all go together down the, uh, the path. Um, and to make sure we do that, I've been on every recalibration committee, and as a majority four leader, I'll make sure that we continue those policies. With respect to the issue of, of tenure, providing uh, uh, teachers certain rights, it does have a place in education. Uh, if you want young people to make a choice to, to enter into these careers, they need to know that they have to have a secure job and that they can make a career out of it at the same time. You, they ought to be able, they have to be accountable for their services and they ought to be able to be discharged if they're simply not delivering the quality of education to the students. Uh, regarding um, funding of, of, of new public schools, the building of new public schools, there's a question regarding um, how the queue works, how decisions are made about who gets a school, um, and it's focusing specifically it's very specific to, to what is the current order, and it's really a follow-up question on um, the context of Laramie High School and where Laramie High School is in the queue. Um, Phil. Yeah. The, uh, the ranking of schools has had, had a changing system that uh, ultimately we have a needs index where we go out and, and uh, institute a needs index, a rating of all the schools throughout the, uh, the, the state. But for a large part of the time, we had a large component, about 30%, that was uh, of the formula for determining when schools are to be allowed was tied to uh, growing population. So if you have uh, adequate facilities in terms of space, you could never get to the top. So we changed that system about uh, four or five years ago um, to uh, begin saying, look, we're going to lower the percentage of the formula that's, that's designated towards whether or not you have sufficient space and go entirely to, or not entirely, but large part to um, the functional needs and where you rank, and that's what brought the Laramie facility to the top of the list. Laramie's facility now is locked in, and in the legislation we passed last year, the compromise was that even if there will be a new needs act coming, uh, a reevaluation, we hire a group, it used to be the MGT group, but we hire experts to come through the state and do an entire state evaluation of every facility and you get ranked. We made sure that Laramie is in the ranking order and uh, Frank, that can be changed by statute, but uh, uh, part of the reason that I wanted to be on the Appropriations Committee and uh, willing to go through the, uh, the chairmanship to, or go up the chairs is to make sure that that school does stay in priority. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, I'm not sure really what I can add to that. Uh, the question was where where does the school currently rank and how do the rankings work? And uh, that has been very well explained by uh, Senator Nicholas. Okay, then we'll turn to the next question, which goes to you. Please explain your ideas about how, as a state, we might improve infrastructure. Well, I think that uh, this has to be a priority for the legislature. Uh, it, it's pretty clear when I drive uh, pretty uh, well on a lot of interstates and a lot of other roads around the state. I've been doing a lot of travel around the state lately, and uh, my, my, my car almost gets swallowed up on uh, I-90 every time. Uh, I think we also need to take a look very seriously at our electronic tra our electro tra electro transmission capabilities. I know that uh, we have uh, we have been looking at that. We need to take that very seriously. Part of the reason that we need to do that is because we need to climb the value chain on our uh, our natural resources, and that includes all of our sources of uh, energy, perhaps building uh, electric power plants, uh, perhaps other things, but. Um, we really need to start getting our resources to market in a higher value form. I also think that uh, we need to take into account the fact that wind energy needs to be part of that mix as it goes into the infrastructure because our largest market, our export market, is California. And California has renewable portfolio standards. Uh, so we need to really make this a priority. Electronic, electric transmission, uh, all of our highways, uh, and really, really need to get on the feds to get the interstates funded because I'm going to blow a tire pretty soon if they don't. Well, you know, I think, frankly, I travel around a lot. I drive a lot. Our roads are in pretty good shape with respect to the roads and highways. We have the road tax. Um, should it be increased? I think it's time to examine that. I think there's no reason why we have a tax. It's almost 10 cents lower than our neighboring states. And you don't see all that pass through. Um, to the uh, consumer, we've studied that over and over. We know that um, we can raise those taxes without influencing our gas taxes to, to go into our infrastructure. When you begin to look at the entire infrastructure, you're looking at your parks, your K-12 buildings, you're looking at your uh, cities, towns, and counties, their facilities, you're looking at the state buildings out there. And uh, we're gonna reach, we've done a, a, a magnificent job of taking our one-time dollars that have been available for the last 10 years that were excess dollars or were appropriated dollars and putting them into our infrastructure. The challenge now is going forward. How do we uh, sustain and maintain those buildings and at the same time provide for our operating budgets, which goes to salaries? It's going to be tough, but we, uh, you know, frankly, you cannot have it both ways. You have to constrain your operating budgets and make sure that they're maintainable in order to provide the excess dollars and continuing dollars for maintenance that we and infrastructure that we've had over the course of the, um, the past uh, 10 years. We won't be able to, uh, to invest in new infrastructure at the rates we have five and six years ago, but uh, that is gets into the direct discussion of the 8% cuts. Why are we doing cuts? And the, really the reason why is we think we have to manage the size of our full-time equivalent employees so that we'll have Thank room you. for infrastructure. Thank you. This question goes to you. How do you plan to respond to constituent questions slash concerns during the session? The, uh, there's a variety of different reasons. I think you know the biggest thing for constituents and concerns is that during the year, you're very involved in your community. You know who your neighbors are and you're involved in problems so that, frankly, you have a good sense of what they are, and that's knowing your neighbors. Um, as long as I've been in the legislature, I still, still remain heavily involved in the community. I've been on the, the Beautification Committee. I'm a member of the um, liaison to the Laramie uh, Economic Development Corporation. I'm heavily involved in uh, matters on the university. And uh, through the uh, session, the, there's a number of ways to keep uh, contact and make sure people understand. Because you need to learn about bills and how they have impact. The easiest way is, frankly, email. Email systems work great. We get uh, hundreds of them a day. Um, that doesn't mean we get to respond to everyone, but we do read them and we make sure that we understand what's important to constituents. And what we really ask is for when constituents see a problem with the bill, that particularly if you believe that we won't recognize it, that you call us and then we return our calls. But by and large, the, uh, the best way to have a grasp of the community is to be very involved. And uh, you know, most of us do this because we like our communities, we like our neighbors, and uh, we stay very involved in our, our local 
uh, events. You see us um, around a lot, and uh, we participate in groups and take your deep interest in our community. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, being responsive to concerns during the session, I am uh, anybody that knows me, I'm, I'm uh, kind of a, an email junkie, I'm kind of a social media junkie, and those are always uh, ways that people can get hold of me. Also, uh, people told me I was a, a little bit uh, of a risk taker because on, the, on my brochures I have my cell number. And my cell is on all the time due to the nature of my job because I'm the International Programs Director and sometimes bad things happen in other countries, not on our uh, 9 to 5 schedule. Uh, so I, I would really very much dedicate myself to making sure that I responded to your emails as, as much as possible. I understand that there are hundreds that come in, but I would like to at least acknowledge each one that comes in, your letters, your phone calls. Uh, and. Uh, and I, I am a big believer in social media, so if you're not on there, even no matter what your age, I'm 42, if I can learn, anybody can, trust me. So uh, I think that, uh, that Facebook and Twitter also are very good ways to reach people and to express your concerns. Okay. Um, this question will go to you first, Dan. Given the value of diverse views and experiences in many complex decisions, uh, would it be a good thing to have more diversity in the legislature, and it's specifically targeted to, uh, in this question, to women, uh, party diversity, and economic diversity in the legislature? Well, there have been many management studies that have shown that uh, the more diverse the, the types of people that sit in a room uh, making a decision, the better the, the decisions tend to be because you get a lot of different perspectives. Part of the reason that I decided to run uh, for this Senate seat is because uh, I participated in a program called Leap into Leadership that the Wyoming Women, Women's Legislative Caucus put on. And that is a diverse group of seven women uh, from all walks of life and from all political parties that uh, tried to get women involved in the legislature. Not because we all think the same, vote the same, have the same opinions about anything, but because we bring value in the kinds of decision making that we make. Um, uh, again, I'm the International Programs Director. I think that uh, having a variety of perspectives is a good thing and uh, conversations uh, from different points of view are much more interesting than everybody singing from the same hymn book all the time. Phil? I think the answer is absolutely. It's a great disappointment to me that, there, that we lost count in the number of uh, women legislators. Um, it's important to have folks from uh, every walk in line uh, there are many times when you're making decisions and the person that you least expect that uh, would participate it brings up a great idea, something that nobody else could see because they come from a different vantage point. So diversity is important. I, uh, I think that uh, as the state moves and we become more urban in our representation for the, uh, the legislature, you're going to see um, a greater diversity. Having said that, uh, I am what I am and I'm here representing you all. Um, I've done a uh, be uh, a lot to, on your behalf, to put myself in a position to do a lot for you. And in this instance, I think, frankly, the uh, uh, being the Vice President of the Senate and the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee has been a great benefit to the, this community and will continue to be so. Moving to Majority Leader um, will be a great benefit to you all. And uh, the, uh, frankly, I'm not sure who's going to be your Majority Floor Leader, but I can assure you that he's not going to be as kind or supportive as our program. Our community is, I'll be for you. Hey, um, before I, we, I, I have two questions. I just want to note that we have about 20 more minutes for this forum. So if there are other questions, I just want to encourage you to uh, write them down and um, raise them so a league member can pick them up. Uh, Phil, this is for you first. Were you surprised at the worker safety report delivered by the state epidemiologist? Do you support a, in, an increased monetary penalty regime? I'll repeat that. Were you surprised at the worker safety report delivered by the state epidemiologist? Do you support a, an increased monetary penalty regime? The answer with respect to the workforce safety report, I was not surprised. As it turns out, this is what I do in my practice. I, uh, I, I am very involved in worker safety issues, and uh, I wasn't surprised. And. Uh, just today we had a long discussion with respect to what uh, causes that. Part of what happens is that 
You can blame part of it on our workers' compensation immunity system where you cannot sue employers. We have insulated our employers from liability, so that the question is, in that environment where employers are insulated from liability, they have uh, affordable insurance, and uh, their risk management simply aren't at where they should be. What do you do? Um, you know, with respect to the fines um, and violations of the, the OSHA, uh, I think I would support them, but I'm not sure that that's where you're going to get your solutions. I don't think that's, frankly, the problem I don't, or the solution. You either have to have more enforcement, but even that, you have to have a culture change in Wyoming where employers are responsible for their employees. And we simply don't have that environment. And it's a shame that every year we continue to get these bad reports. Well, I also, uh, I suppose I wasn't uh, surprised either. I followed that fairly closely in the, in the news. And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a good portion of our worker safety issues and our, our poor rating when it comes to uh, to workplace safety, and it comes down to driving violations, and, and a lot of that comes down to the nature and the structure of our economy, where we have a lot of jobs where people have to drive. Um, I, I think that uh, it, penalties, a mix of penalties, and I'd say probably more stronger enforcement and or support from the state to, to help employers understand the consequences of, uh, of, uh, of workplace safety violations. Uh, this is something that you really have to make a balance. You don't. Uh, you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to put too much of uh, of a penalty on small firms so that they would, uh, you know, be driven out of business in order to try to come into compliance, uh, because then you lose the jobs altogether. But you certainly need to protect worker safety. I think we've seen uh, several times in the past few years where. Uh, where uh, uh, small things could have made a big difference and saved somebody's life or, and or livelihood. And so it, it's very important for us to continue to work with employers on this. Okay, this is the final question I have, uh, unless someone is brought to me. Um, given that, and Anne, this comes to you first, given that we are absolutely dependent on fossil fuel extraction taxes, could you honestly accept any scientific finding that showed the extract, that the extraction is harmful to citizens? I'll repeat that. Given that we are absolutely dependent on fossil fuel extraction taxes, could you honestly accept any scientific finding that showed that that showed the extraction is harmful to citizens? Well, um, I think I said earlier, and I'll say again that that I think that uh, pretty much all extraction of our uh, of our resources comes with some cost, and that doesn't include wind energy. There are some environmental costs to that as well. Um, would I accept scientific evidence of, uh, of that harm? I think that when scientists point out that there are costs, we, we need to listen. And uh, I, I agree, we have a strong reliance on our, on our uh, energy sector. What we need to do is start to think about ways to, if there is scientific evidence that shows that something is uh, damaging, say, sage grass uh, habitat or, or something along those lines, just to pick an example out of the air, um, we need to find ways to mitigate the damage and try to find ways that our fossil fuel extraction can coexist with our beautiful environment. That's why we live here. Um, if there are things that are going to cause irreparable harm, we need to think about uh, how we're going to uh, it, we, how we're going to work uh, towards moving past those industries. I think when the Permanent Wyoming Mineral Trust Fund was set up, uh, it was set up with the exact reasoning that someday the resources would probably run out, at least the economic extraction of them would, would run out. So uh, we always need to look to the future to try to diversify this economy and make it more resilient, recognizing that this state has prospered and, uh, and grown because of the fossil fuel industry uh, over the past 50 and 60 years. Well, I, I think the answer is that uh, we all accept that there is a, um, a harm or an injury, if you will, in burning fossil fuels. We can see it. Um, you don't have to look very far. Go back and look at pictures of Pittsburgh when the, uh, uh, the Gary, Indiana plants were uh, at full blast and you could barely see through the, through the air. And uh, everybody knew that was bad for you. You know that if you're working in the, uh, the coal industry and you're exposed to coal dust, that it's going to be bad for you. 
Having said that, I'm, uh, I'm not a hypocrite. I, I drove my car here. I enjoy flying overseas to do that, to go see other countries. I enjoy all the benefits that uh, cheap fuel have brought us. And I think on the balance is that the, uh, I think we live longer on account of a lot of these uh, achievements. I think that uh, uh, these are things that we uh, have to evaluate. And I also believe that climate change will take place um, over the course of time for the world no matter what. Should we do more to uh, limit or to reduce emissions, to reduce greenhouse gases? Absolutely. And the question is how much? And should there be a fiscal analysis in terms of what we can afford and what we're prepared for? Absolutely, there always a balance. Okay. Um, this concludes the Q&A portion of our forum. I want to ask if um, Nancy Lockwood has um, maybe an announcement that she'd like to, about the next forums again, or, um, yeah, yeah.